There says your son, Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks, your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you for there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household, all that you have, do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we again come standing behind this sacred desk and Lord, to attempt to handle your holy, holy, holy word. And Heavenly Father, we come asking for grace again to preach and to teach your word. We're asking for grace because grace always brings glory to you. Will you empower me afresh? Feel me, Holy Spirit, work in me to will and to do right now as I handle your living word. Oh, Father, bless your people. They need to hear you proclaiming these truths to them, your word. Will you open up the ears of their understanding, give them grace to hear and receive your word. May you get glory in the preaching, the hearing, and the receiving of your word. And Heavenly Father, all of this can only happen by your grace. And if there be any person here, it doesn't matter whether they are members of Resurrected or not, if there be any person here that is not yet in Christ, Oh, send your Holy Spirit into their hearts so that they too can cry, Abba, Father. Embrace Jesus Christ by faith as Lord and Savior. It is in his name I ask and for his sake. Amen. Okay, this is the reunion part three. That is the focus of this chapter. The reunion. But today I want to, what I want to emphasize about the reunion today is reconciliation. We have seen the revelation of his person uh, as Joseph revealed himself in verses 1 through 4. And what we saw there is we, we looked at a forgiving, compassionate heart. And of course, in seeing Joseph's forgiving and compassionate heart, we saw in an even greater way the forgiving and compassionate heart of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who beckons us, come near to me. And then in verses 5 through 8, we, we saw the revelation of God's purpose, okay? And in that we saw God's sovereignty, his sovereign hand of providence that brings everything about. We saw his amazing wisdom and how he brought everything about. But we also saw that our theology, our understanding of God enables us to forgive. 
our brothers and sisters. Didn't we? God is so amazing. God is so, so amazing. Well, well today, we, we, as we continue to look at this tremendous reunion that, that, that God has brought about, we want to focus on reconciliation. Now, let's talk a little bit about what that is. It, it, it is the restoration of a relationship from a state of hostility to one of peace. Anytime there's reconciliation, that means there has been alienation, separation, legally, spiritually, right? So reconciliation is the act of settling or restoring differences. It's the restoring of a, of a relationship. It is, it is a settling or, or resolving of, of differences, if you will, between friends. The Old Testament Hebrew word kepar, uh, which means to cover, and is most often translated uh, as atonement. Atonement is the sacrificial act that covers a person's sins and brings that person into reconciliation with God. Proverbs writes in Proverbs 16, 16, through love and faithful, faithfulness, sin is atoned for. In the New Testament, the Greek word katalaso, it's translated reconciled, means to change mutually or, or figuratively, to settle a, a debt kindly. Jesus Christ has become the sacrifice for our sins. He settled our debt, as we heard so clearly this morning, reconciling us to God and giving us a ministry of reconciliation to others. We owed a debt that we could not pay. He paid a debt that he did not owe. Paul writes it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.18, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Wow. Well, that's what's going on here. Joseph has been alienated from his family, separated, for the same reason you and I were alienated and separated from God because of sin. Right? <laughs> same reason, isn't it? Because of sin. He's taken away, separated because of sin. And now he's being reconciled because of the work of God in his brother's heart and the work of God in his heart. Now pay attention. In order for there to be reconciliation between two parties, there, I, I, I'm talking about humanly, on, on the human level between two brothers and sisters, or, or sisters and sisters, or, or, there has to be a work of God in both hearts. Now, 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 I can't be reconciled to you just because, you know, I come and say I'm sorry, and then you, you still treat me the same way. That's not reconciliation. That's what we're, we're going to see. Uh, this morning. There has to be a work of God in both hearts. Now, I'm not talking about robotic work. You know, when the, when the doctor does the robotic surgery. We are not God's robots. We're in a relationship with him. We have been given the Holy Spirit, and we have the responsibility to yield to him by submitting to his word and Discipline ourselves unto godliness to do what we know is right in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Right? So we're not talking about the work of God in terms of it being treating us as if we were robots. We're in a relationship. You with, you with me? So, with that said, we need to unpack here what the Lord is teaching us from this text. 
uh, concerning reconciliation. So my, I'm going to make this main point here. I want to talk this morning from this text concerning the power of true reconciliation, the power of true reconciliation. Let's just walk through here. You know, I'm not getting any younger, and this is actually my fourth sermon since Friday. The Chesters demanded that I preach yesterday at their daughter's wedding. <laughs> oh, but you know what? So Christ-centered, so God-centered, so Christ-exalting. Oh, it was my pleasure and privilege to be in a, there on such an occasion. Young people getting married, but you know, no boogie wiggy and all that foolishness, just Christ being exalted. Okay, right? So I, 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 do, I do commend you and Sister Chester and just how this, that whole yesterday was absolutely beautiful. The power of true reconciliation. So yeah, yeah this is my third sermon. I got one more, but. That's what I'm called to do, preach. True reconciliation, number one, demands truthfulness. Demands truthful, truthfulness. Pastor, where do you see that? Verse 9, follow me. Harry, and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. First, we see the truth about what God has done right? The first subject of the first sentence that Joseph asked his brothers to share with his father was the living God. Joseph is so radically God-centered, God-focused, God-trusting, and he wants his father to know that the exaltation that he has experienced over the last 22 years had been a God-created God sustained exaltation. He wanted to strengthen his father's faith in the sovereign lordship of God over his life and over the life of his son. You see, you can't have reconciliation unless you know the truth about God. <laughs> have I got any warriors? You know, for example, in, in reference to our salvation, you cannot be reconciled back to God and you don't know the truth about Jesus. You got, you, you've got to know who he is, his person, and you've got to uh, have an understanding of what he has done, his work. Right? See, if you don't have the truth about him, you cannot be reconciled. But even in our relationships with one another as Christians, we cannot be reconciled unless everybody is willing to submit to the truth about God and what he said. The truth about God's providence strengthens our faith in the Lord. So first of all, yeah, it demands truthfulness, the truth about God. But secondly, we see the truth about the brothers. See, the brothers have got to tell the truth. He said, Pastor, wait a minute. Where, where, where do you see that in the text? Well, they've got to go to Jacob. Tell Jacob the good news. That Joseph is alive. Joseph is Lord of Egypt. Right? But in telling him the good news, they must tell him the bad news. They, they, they must tell him how Joseph got to Egypt in the first place. Have I got any warriors? See, 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 they not only need to be reconciled to Joseph, but it's been 20 plus years and they have not been reconciled to their father. Hmm, wait a minute, I see something there, <laughs> right? See, they would have to tell the truth about what they did to their brother, how they treated their brother, right? 
They would have to confess. Dad, we've been lying for over 20 years. They, they, they would have to really bring out the truth of what was going on in their hearts. They, they, they would have to confess. Yeah, the reason we treated Joseph like that, Dad, is because we got jealous and our jealous, jealousy led to bitterness, and our bitterness led to hatred, and our hatred led to murderous thoughts and actions toward our brother. We saw him coming. We stripped his clothes off of him. We beat him. We threw him in a pit. Then we decided to sell him into slavery. That's how he got to Egypt. We sold him to those Midianites coming down the road. See, beloved, no healing is possible without truth. You got to have some confession. You got to have some open confession. See, we like to think of reconciliation this way. That's just her. We don't want to work through it. And watch this. We don't like to be held accountable to work through it. Have I got some warriors? Let's just hug. Let's just cry. No, 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 no. Let's just tell the truth. Tell, no, 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 no. You tell me what's really been going on in your heart towards me. You, 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 you express why you had this hatred all these years. Right? Got to have the truth, right? Got to have some confession. For that to be reconciliation. See... Really and truly, when we came to Christ, we didn't just confess, Lord, I've been smoking weed. <laughs> Deliver me from smoking weed. No, when you come to Christ, it's Lord, if you, if you got saved at age 18, it's Lord, my whole life has been wrong, sinful for 18 years. I've been against you, I've hated you, I've offended you for 18 years straight, every single day. My heart has been against you. My very nature was in bondage to sin, and I was a born hater of God. Right? God's not going to save you without confession. No, 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 no. You don't confess sin, you don't get... You don't get saved. And listen, Christians, you don't confess sin, you don't get forgiveness. Listen, Christians, you don't confess sin, you don't get forgiveness. I need some Christians to listen to me. If you don't confess sin, you don't get forgiveness. Now listen, your brother or sister might not know what's going on in your heart, but remember, God does. You might tell them, well, the reason I said that I'm just having a bad day. No, no, you weren't just having a bad day. Uh-uh, no, it wasn't just a bad day. Stop lying and confess. Right? No healing without it. But all oh, the healing is sweet with it. Isn't the healing sweet with it? See, go down to your father, right? But, but, but what, what, what precedes that is the truth about God. Sometimes we go, we, we go into reconciliation with our brother or sister. If we go into it without the truth about God, we might tell them anything. <laughs> but see, if you, uh, if you go into it with the truth about God in your heart, then you're going to tell them really what's been going on. I don't want to hurt you, Doc, but... <laughs> right? So, so it takes the truth about God. It takes the truth confessed concerning your sin. You all with me? Now watch this. Hurry up and go. You see the text? I don't want to get stuck here in this verse. <laughs> but... Hurry up and go. See, 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 reconciliation is not something we need to procrastinate about. Right? Can I talk to you a minute, married couples? Get mad at one another? Know you're wrong? 
No, you're in sin. You're walking around in the same house not speaking. Do I have any warriors here? No, no, it's not something you need to procrastinate about. So, well, I've been praying, so why, why, are there, why, why, why is there not any feet to your prayer? You've been praying and you're still living in sin. I'm wondering who you've been talking to. Because when I talk to God, God changes me. Right? Don't procrastinate. See, see, really, this should not have went on for 20 years. 20 plus years, it should not. And, 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 and really, the stuff that goes on in here shouldn't just continue to go on. But we, we procrastinate. Because though we intellectually say we have the truth about God, but, but, but the truth about God is more than an intellectual knowledge. It is an intimate experiential knowledge that actually affects how you think and the decisions you make. And I'm not saying this is easy. I'm not saying it's easy. But it is right. Hurry up. Hurry up. Go, go now. Hurry up. I, I, I wonder, should I do it or not? Uh, uh, hurry up. I wonder, should I go out to service? Hurry up. I wonder if my wife is sitting next to me right now. Should I say something? Hurry up. Have I got any warriors? I wonder if I've offended my children. Should I say something right now? Hurry up. I wonder, children, if, if, if you offended your parents and, 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 and you, you, you're in sin and you haven't apologized and you haven't sought to be reconciled, children, hurry up. Hurry up. Let me get some help on that hurry up. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. If you are, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you. That you remember that he has something against you. I'm not talking about what you've done. I'm talking about that he has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Jesus says, hurry up. Hurry up. The time for reconciliation is just like the time for salvation is now. Hurry up. T tomorrow, is, tomorrow could be too late. We're not to allow bitterness and anger and hatred and all this other sin in us to keep us separated from other people, whoever they are. Hurry up. That's why it's such a big problem, because you didn't hurry up. And then you start procrastinating. Then you start thinking, well, really, really, no, really, you should have hurried up. Number two. Okay, the power of true reconciliation, it demands truth, truthfulness. Number two, true reconciliation welcomes nearness. Y'all better stay with me. I didn't get this from any commentary. I got, that, I got this from the Lord. It welcomes nearness. How do I know that? Verse 10. I got it right here. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. So Joseph, you said that you're forgiving your brothers. How do we know you're sincere? <laughs> Joseph says, because I want them near me. You mean to tell me, Joseph, you're not going to shake hands and hug and then the next Sunday you go that way and they go that way? <laughs> Joseph says, no, I'm not going to do that. I want them near me. Joseph, are you talking about just a one-time shaking of hands or are you talking about a consistent relationship that you're wanting with them? Joseph said, yeah, I want them, I want them near me. <laughs> I want them near me. I want their children near me. I want their children's 
children near me. I want the flocks and the herds near me. Wow. Okay, Joseph, I believe you. <laughs> what is so unfortunate is that we don't often see that type of reconciliation today. I want you to dwell in the region of Goshen. I know it's a big clan. You're going to need significant territory. You're going to need good grazing land. According to uh, chapter 47, uh, verse 11, that, that, uh, Goshen was identified with the, with the land of, of Ramses, and it is rich land. It's land that the king had not even assigned yet. Oh, my goodness. Rich pasture. I don't just want you near me. I want you near me, and I'm going to give you the fat of the land. Wow. You know what? You, if you all have been with me sometime, you, you, you know that I love the church. And I believe our best day is the Lord's day each week because we're able to meet with one another, worship God, hear his word, break bread, renew fellowship. It's hard for me. My wife can tell you this. It's hard for me to miss Sunday. It's a trial for me. Because I'm not meeting with the people that I know and love and that I'm in this vital union with them. Joseph is talking like his future is tied up in the lives of his brothers and their families. <laughs> you, you're gonna be right home to get that. He, he acts like his future is actually tied up in the lives of his brothers and their families, his father. You know why he is acting like that? It is. It is. And you know what? Your future is tied up in the lives of your brothers and sisters, not only here, but universally around the world. Heaven is a family of people. The, the church is a family of people. Joseph loved his father. He loved his brothers. He loved his family. He wanted them near him. Now, no, it's not the ideal family. No, he's talking to boys who at one time wished him dead. He's talking to his brothers who made money out of selling him into slavery. Right? I'm afraid sometimes we want the ideal before we can be reconciled. Now listen, husbands, wives, do you think that you could actually be married to someone that wouldn't sin against you? You're not married to Jesus. You got to be married to Jesus, right? And there's no marriage in heaven, so you have to be married to Jesus. Right? It's never, no, it's not the ideal family. Yeah, they're sinful. But God can bring reconciliation even between sinful people. When there's true confession, God can bring reconciliation, right? And you can't have it without nearness. Okay. Tina and I have a disagreement, and I get mad at her. And she go in one room, I, go, I come out and go in the other. She said, well, and she says to me, well, well, well I thought everything was okay. Where everything is okay, I just want to be in here right now. I don't have to stay in there. Uh, 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 nothing in the Bible tells me I have to stay in there. <laughs> I know I'm getting into somebody's business. 
Because that's how we talk, right? That's how we talk to try to justify what we do. No, no. Listen to me. In order for us to be saved, Jesus had to come down. You need to take it easy, son. You got another sermon, all right? In order for us to come down, in order for us to be saved, Jesus had to come down and actually pitch his tent among us, right? John chapter 1, I think it's verse 14, right? He had to come down. He, he had to actually take on human nature. You can't get any nearer, there than, nearer than that, right? When the, when the Lord saves us, watch this, when the Lord saves us, he sends his Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, in order for us to be reconciled, has to come into us. There has to be a nearness. Because you can't have reconciliation while you still push people away. You can't have Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde reconciliation. Hello, I love you. Oh, yes. Next Sunday. Hey, I'm just saying hello to this brother over here. Right? You can't have Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde reconciliation. You can't have reconciliation while one Sunday you're loving people, the next Sunday you're not. Right? You can't have reconciliation while you're pushing people away. Joseph says, I want you near me. <laughs> My father says, I want you near me. My Savior says, I want you near me. The, the Holy Spirit says, I want to be near you. Mm, that blesses my soul. Because true reconciliation welcomes nearness. I, I, I didn't say it just says, okay, I want you near me. I said it welcomes nearness. This was not their suggestion to live near Joseph. It was Joseph's. Right? The nearness came from the one who was forgiving them. The, the, the whole idea of nearness mm, smells like Jesus to me. I smell the fragrance of my Savior in that. And, and, and if our lives are to be conformed to the image, and we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, then reconciliation needs to look like that in our lives. We welcome people. We don't push them away. See, Joseph could have just said, oh, well, I don't want you near me now because I know I remember the beatings and the hand slaps and all of that. If he had said that, he, had not, he would not have forgiven them. Okay, thirdly, you with me? Uh, reconciliation responds differently. Say, I already see that, Pastor, well, I want you to see it some more. It, reconciliation, true reconciliation responds differently. Look at verse 11. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. Look at the consideration he's showing for their provision. You know, we're told constantly in the New Testament of the concern of the early church for those in need. You know, whether they're taking up a collection for the famine hitting church in Jerusalem or for Paul, we're told of these Christ-like actions. And then we're also told that God supplies all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. So we're urged to show our love for the brethren and help them when they're sick, lonely, hungry, in prison, or whatever. We're asked, how can we say, John, John poses this question, how can we say we love God whom we have not seen, whom we do not love the brethren whom we have seen? Joseph not only forgives his brothers, but he takes care of them. Oh my goodness, right? Now, now, now listen. 
if you came to me and said, okay, Pastor, I really love your head, but I hate your body. Now, you know I would look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> you know I would give that smart aleck look, excuse me? <laughs> Which I'm communicating to you that you're crazy, okay? <laughs> because that, that makes no sense, does it? Yes. Makes no sense at all. Didn't Elder tell us this morning that we are the body of Christ? Christ is the head? It's just not possible to pick and choose which one you're going to love. It's just as foolish, right? I want to show you this point of how true reconciliation responds differently. I really want to, want, want to highlight it from, uh, uh, from, from, from this chapter, okay? Okay? Now, listen very carefully. Joseph's brothers had rejected him beat him, threw him into a pit, and would not even listen to his cries for help. But reconciliation responds differently than that, right? Because here we see Joseph's commitment to provide for them when they need help, and they do, not only for a little while, but throughout the famine. And not only to provide for them, but to provide for them and their household. Right? That's a different response, isn't it? Watch this. Joseph's brothers had driven him as far away from them as they could. But now, when it's Joseph's turn to be in control, he says in verse 4, come close to me. He says in verse 10, I want you near me. That's a different response, isn't it? Because true reconciliation responds differently. Watch this. Joseph's brothers had sent him off as a captive to Egypt on the back of a mangy camel. But according to verse 21, he gave them fine Egyptian carts for the journey home. That sounds different, doesn't it? Of course it does, because true reconciliation responds differently. Listen, Joseph's brothers were willing to leave him to die of thirst and starvation in the pit, in the pit. But watch this. According to verse 21, he gave them provisions for the trip back to Canaan. He provided for them during the famine, verse 11 and verse 21. That's, that's different, isn't it? Of course it's different. True reconciliation responds differently. Listen, Joseph's brothers had torn his clothes, but according to verse 22 of our chapter, he gave them clothes. He said, that's different. Of course it's different. Reconciliation responds differently. Listen, Joseph's brothers had sold him for money. But he gave Benjamin 300 shekels of silver. Verse 22, Joseph even gave his brothers wise counsel, knowing their tendencies don't quarrel on the way. Verse 24, that sounds, that sounds different, doesn't it? Of course, true reconciliation responds differently. How would you say that Joseph is able to respond differently? Verse 9, he, he had the truth about God. You see what is happening here? Do you really see what's happening? Joseph returned there every evil, cruel, and merciless act with goodness and kindness and mercy. Wow. I'm talking to somebody in here right now. You're saying, I just, I just can't do that, Pastor. Okay. I agree with you. but the Lord can do it through you. Can he do it? Can he do it? He can do it. Through you. Oh, yes, yes. See, that's why we are, we're to yield ourselves as instruments of righteousness for his name's sake. Romans six thirteen, right? You remember a century before Paul wrote, if your enemy is hungry, I mean, centuries afterwards, uh, Paul, Paul, Paul wrote, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 20 and 21. You see, attitude is so crucial in the Christian life. We can go through the Sunday motions. 
We can carry out the religious exercises. We can pack a Bible under our arms. We can sing the songs from memory and yet can still hold grudges against the people who sin against us. And even in our, our own way, and I think it's nothing more, nothing but religious manipulation, even in our own way, we get back at them. It's, it's subtle, it's deceptive. But listen, that's not God's way. God is showing you here the right way, very practical, walking you through it. See, you've got to, the just have to live by faith. And I'm not saying to just have to live by faith when we don't have enough food. Not, not just then. I'm not saying to just has to live by faith when I don't have a job. No, not just then. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm saying to just have to live by faith every day. No matter what, what occurs. Now listen, here's what true faith really looks like when it's seeking to be reconciled. First, when I'm able by faith to see God's plan in my location, when I'm able by faith to see God's plan in my location, when I'm able by faith to see God's plan in my location, my attitude will be right. How do I know that? J Joseph kept saying, God sent me, God sent me, God sent me. See, not until you can relax and see God in your present location will you be useful to him. See, a positive theological attitude will do wonders for our geographical latitude. Want it? God put me, God put me, God put me, God sent me. But Joseph, why aren't you focusing on what they did to you? Because I see God in my location. Joseph, how are you able to forgive them? Because I see God in my location. Joseph, how can you tell them to draw near to you? Because I see God in my location. Joseph, how can you respond so differently? Because I see God in my location. Number two, when I'm able by faith to sense God's hand in my situation, to sense God's hand in my situation, my attitude will be right. See, when you sense God's hand in your situation, you stop gritting your teeth in anger and asking the same old question every day. Why do I have to stay in this situation? Instead, I believe that he made me the way I am. He put me where I am to do what he has planned for me to do. Right? I don't wait for my situation to change before, before I put my heart into my work. I'll say it again, uh, 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 Brother Carter, I believe that he made me the way I am and he put me where I am to do what he has planned for me to do. So I don't wait on my situation to change before I put my heart into it. Right? There's nothing like an attitude of gratitude to free us up to do what God has called us to do. Come on. You're not acting by faith if you're mad all the time. Have I got any warriors in this house? Nobody could have done that unless God allowed it. So my location is a God-ordained location. God has me here. And I want to be like Isaiah. Send me, I'll go. I don't want to be like Jonah. God says go this way, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna catch a ship to Tarshish. My location is Nineveh. Then I want to give him glory in Nineveh. Right? That's living by faith. So if you're just sitting back, mad because things haven't changed, then admit you're mad at God because your location is because of God's sovereign providence. Thirdly, I, I gotta move on out of this, but when I'm able by faith to accept both my location and situation as good, even when there has been evil in the process, 
my attitude will be right. Right? When I can say like Joseph, God meant it for good. <laughs> when I can say like Joseph, God meant it for good. It takes God to make the heart right when I have a wrong attitude. See, when I have a wrong attitude, and when you have a wrong attitude, we look at things humanly, don't we? They did this to me. I don't want them near me. That's humanly. They did this to me. I ain't provide nothing. It's enough that I let them come down here. Humanly, right? But when I have a, when, when God has done a work in my heart, I look at life divinely. I start thinking, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for me. I deserve the wrath of God, but he didn't just, as Elder said this morning, come stand by me. He took my place, received what I deserve. So I am to take that gospel attitude, and I am to live it out horizontally right? It changes the way you look at people. That's living by faith. That's living by faith. That's living by faith whether you believe it or not. That's living by faith. And you know what? I want my attitude right because a wrong attitude is an offense against God. Right? So uh, true, 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 true reconciliation, beloved, does respond differently, doesn't it? Radically different. Not just a little, little bit different. Joseph's response is radically different from their response to him back in chapter 37. See, Christianity doesn't just look a little bit like Christ and a little bit like the world. Christianity is radical, right? New heart, new spirit, Holy Spirit, come live in me. Right? The world says, get all you can get. But Christianity is totally different. The, 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 the very opposite of that. Okay. We respond differently. Right? And listen, if I'm sitting here, if I'm, if I'm preaching and you're sitting here, you're saying, I have not responded that way. Be of good cheer. God has you right here, right now, listening to his word. And if you have not responded that, that way, God is saying to you, repent and respond that way. Right? Right? I don't want you leaving here as a man, pastor, preach that, that reconciliation this morning. Woo, he preached that. You see all those points that he got, got out of that text? Woo. Oh boy, I saw it, and I saw it, and, 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 and you're still not speaking to your brother. I don't need any accolades. Okay? I'm here, to, I'm here to bring glory to him anyway. Okay? I want you to see Christ, and I want you to respond to him. Fourthly, true reconciliation is reassuring. So, Pastor, where did you get that at? Oh, verse 12. I got it right at verse 12. Watch this. And now your eyes see, in the eyes of my brother Benjamin, see that it is my mouth that speak, speaks to you. And I want to connect this. Notice the latter part of verse 15. After that, his brothers talked with him. Look at Joseph. Look how reassuring he is. Listen. People that have offended you need reassuring. Do you hear me? I'm talking about when their heart is broken, when, they, when their heart has come to repentance, and, 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 and even when they want to come to you, they, you ought to have a reassuring attitude. The voice that you hear is indeed the voice of your long-lost brother Joseph. It's really me speaking to you. Now, 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 understand the interpreter is gone. He is speaking to them in Hebrew. 
their own language. He spoke to them in a language that they understood in order to uh, 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 reassure them. They recognized his voice. <laughs> right? <laughs> See, brothers and sisters, people need to know it's okay. There's going to be true reconciliation. We need to make sure we lay out the welcome mat. Mm, my goodness. Let, let, let me just give you an example. That's how God does me and you and all of us. That's how God does us. Because scripture is God speaking to us, isn't it? That's why I, I love, that's why I love reading the Bible, okay? That's why we have the response of reading. That's why you open up with the reading of the word. And, and you're reading the word, you're participating in worship. But scripture is God speaking to us. Right? Have you ever heard him so personally and sincerely as you read the word speaking to you? Saying, don't worry, I'll work things out for your good. You're having a difficult time, he says... Don't worry, nothing is going to separate you from my love. You're, you're wondering, how am I going to make it financially? You hear him, don't worry, I'll, I'll supply all your needs. The doctor gives you a bad report, death's coming. He says, don't worry, when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll be with you. And where I am, you will be also. You will dwell with me forever in my house. Don't worry. It's really me speaking to you. That, that's the way it is in God's word. It's really God speaking to us. And we're to believe every promise in his word. And when we're feeling as cold as ice, we are to believe every promise. When no word comes jumping out the pages of scripture, thrilling us, we're still to believe it is God speaking to us. Because it matters to God that we trust him, that we trust his promises that are yes and amen in Christ. Every great and, great and precious promise. You're sitting here right now. And I know you've been a little bit uncomfortable, but God says, stop focusing on Jack so much. It's really me speaking to you. It's really me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I stopped by Resurrected this morning. I know exactly where you are. It's really me speaking to you. Don't you get mad at Eddie D. You know I'm nothing but a mailman anyway. A mailman in my little truck with my stuff putting something in your mailbox. Right? It's really me speaking to you. God, re what I want you to understand, God continues to reassure us. And even if you're saying, if I go to this person, if I go to that person, if there's true reconciliation, if there's reconciliation and forgiveness, this might happen, that might happen. God says, don't worry. You can always trust my word. Don't worry. You can always trust my word. Just trust and obey. It's really me speaking to you. Well, you notice the latter part of verse 15 that I mentioned? Joseph continues talking with them after he kissed them. Now, you remember what we just read from the preceding verses? Joseph was very, really anxious to get who there? His father, Jacob. The verses contain three expressions of Joseph, Joseph's understandable haste. He hasn't seen them in over 20 years. Hear back to my father, verse 9. Say to him, come down to me, don't delay, verse 9. Bring my father down here quickly, verse 13. He wants dad here now. But wait a minute. He has an understandable impatience to see his father. That's why the latter part of verse 15 blows me away. 
Joseph could, took considerable time to be with his brothers, talk with them, reassure them of his love and forgiveness. You know why he did that? Because they needed reassurance. They were shocked to see Joseph. They were shocked to see him. They had to get to know him again. They had to overcome their anxiety and be assured of his favor. That's difficult, even years later. And they, they, and they, and they know that they, what they did. And you get over to chapter 50, after Jacob dies, after Jacob's brought to Egypt and he dies, the brothers get scared again. Joseph has to reassure them all over again. See, brothers and sisters, let's have that kind of heart. That sounds so much like Jesus. You remember when Jesus got out, rose up from the grave? You remember reading that? Jesus rises from the grave. <laughs> Tells his disciples, meet me. You, you, you know he stayed on earth 40 days. You know he, 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 was, he was back and forth for 40 days, right? On earth. You know what he was doing? Reassuring his disciples. Mm. I mean, every one of them deserted him. Peter denied him three times. They needed reassurance. He comes through a closed door. They're, they're terrified. He says, peace, 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 peace. Don't be afraid. They needed reassurance. Right? Jesus told them everybody's going to desert me, and they did it. And what about what, what about old brother Peter? When it comes to Peter in, in, in chapter 21 of John, Peter needs reassurance. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter like, yeah. He says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. He, he, he could have derided Peter for, 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 for denying him. Peter, I can't believe you did what you did. But he spent time with him because Peter needed healing. He didn't need a bat taken to him. He some reassuring. Because that's what true reconciliation does. You know why I keep coming to my father every day in repentance and confession. Every day. My wife and I get up we, we, and, and, and during the morning we, we pray together. We're, we're praying. And, and, and you know, we're, we're confessing sin. We're asking for God's mercy. We're praying every, every day. You know why I feel free to do that? Because of the reassuring grace I see in the gospel. I'm not coming to God like, oh, he's going to stomp me. Oh, I can't. No, I'm coming to God in confession because God has given me so much reassurance. I've got 66 reassuring books all about Christ, all pointing to Christ, who he is and what he's done. <laughs> right? Are you going to treat people that way, though? Come on, wives, husbands, are you going to treat each other that way? Listen. If Tina has offended me and she's coming to me I'm, and I'm like, yeah. Does that look reassuring to you? Do you think she's drawn to that? But if I'm a Luke 15 person, That boy coming down that road. <laughs> oh, daddy running toward me. Daddy coming toward me. Yes. You ever doubt the love of Christ? I always know that was him coming. And then he came. And then he said, boo. 
bam, 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 right at his feet. And the wrath came down on him. If you need some reassuring love, remember the gospel. I pray that God would put these truths into your heart and that will be the type of true reconciliation among us as believers in Christ. Lastly, true reconciliation expresses unity. It does. You must tell my, verse 13 through 15, you must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and all the, that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Verse 14, then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers, verse 15, and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. True reconciliation expresses unity. So, Pastor, where did you get that at? I got it right from those verses. Notice the unity is centered in God's revelation. It's centered there. I mean, why does Joseph emphasize that they ought to tell his father about his rule and his glory in Egypt? Is he still prideful like he was in chapter 37? No. It's because he wants his father to remember God's revelation in the dream. What did God say in the dream? God said that he was going to exalt Joseph, and Joseph wants his father to remember the dream and realize the Lord your God has brought his revelation to pass in a most amazing way. We could not have dreamt in a million years that the grain bowing to my son Joseph and the stars and the sun and the moon bowing to my son Joseph, the ruler of Egypt, Right? Tell him of my honor. Because, Dad, it is a fulfillment of the revelation of God. Dad, the, watch this, the unity that we did not have at home was actually revealed and prophesied and now fulfilled through the revelation of God. Dad, when I was at home, we didn't have unity. Because I was your favorite, my own brothers hated me, and there was just no unity. It was totally a sinful, dysfunctional family. But God, even, he, even through all of this sinfulness that has happened, God has brought his revelation to pass. And so our unity is, is, is centered in the very revelation of God. You know why we have unity? Because God said it. Didn't he? God brought this about. Christians, may I say something to you? Did you know that unity is not something we have to create? Did you not know that, that, that do you not know that we already have unity? You say, I don't believe that. Well, the Holy Spirit has made us one in Christ. Mm, sounds like unity. We're all in union with Christ and thus with one another. Sounds like unity. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Sounds like unity to me. Now, Pastor, why don't we always experience the unity that we have? Because we don't endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4. We don't endeavor to keep it. But I know that's going to change after today because you heard the truth, right? The Word of God. The, the Word of God says we have unity, but we're called to live out what we already have. Unity is centered in God's revelation, but unity is also expressed in love. Joseph threw his arms around Benjamin's neck, wept. Benjamin hugged Joseph, wept. That's understandable. These are two brothers. Same mom. He's Rachel's two boys, right? M Benjamin was involved in the hating of Joe, uh, uh, in, in hating Joseph, and wanted to kill him. So, we understand that, and it's true. It, it, it is a true. It is a real, however, true reconciliation uh, because they have been distant and alienated from one another for all these years. It's not like the false reconciliation of Jacob and Esau. 
It wasn't true because Esau never did unite. Never did. It was distrust and deception clouding the whole meeting. But Joseph blows us away in verse 15, doesn't he? He reached out and kissed all of his brothers and wept over them. Joseph, who had far less revelation than all of us have, Joseph, who had far less understanding of Christ than we have if you listen regularly at this church and take in the word and meditate on it. Joseph, who had no New Testament and no Old Testament. Joseph kissed those 10 men who had wished him dead and were really now at his mercy. It wasn't a Judas kiss of betrayal. It was a kiss of complete forgiveness. So I asked saints, can you really kiss your brothers and sisters? I'm not talking about the physical act, this is spiritual. Can you really kiss them? Or are you still holding grudges? Are you still holding grudges that are really microscopic in comparison to what we see with Joseph? That are really just tiny, you need a magnifying glass to see in comparison to what we see with Joseph. If you're still holding grudges and you can't truly embrace, truly show love towards your brothers and sisters, you don't understand forgiveness. You know why your wheels keep getting stuck in a ditch? Because you're on the wrong path. You're harboring forgiveness towards someone. You won't give it to them. You can't worship. You can't witness. You're not useful for the kingdom of God. Can you truly kiss them? This is the kiss of love. Do I have some warriors in here? Reconciliation comes through forgiveness. And forgiveness, as we've seen, comes through the recognition of God's sovereignty. If somebody has, has, has sinned against you, you can see them as God sees them. You can perceive them as God planned for them. And, and, and you can communicate that understanding with compassion and forgiveness. And then reconciliation can come. You hold that grudge, you're going to do nothing but retaliate one way or the other. This is a marvelous picture. I'm closing. The life of Joseph. Life of Joseph and his brothers could have ended with all of them being Joseph's slaves. And you know what? If we, if we were looking at this on television, if this was a television show, that's what we would want. Look at how they did him. So, wow, what a great ending, man. I'm glad they got him. all of them his slaves. I'm glad, wow. Look at that. That's the, now that's the way a story ought to end. And Joseph lived happily ever after his brothers shining his shoes, bringing him uh, food every day, being his servants, and then going back to the dungeon for what they did. That's right. We would say, that's a good ending. Right? I mean, come on, don't you want Superman to win? Get the bad guys, right? But God says, I'm going to show you a better ending than that. Right? I'm going to show you a better ending than that. I'm going to show you my kind of ending. That's your type of ending. 
That's the world's view of how everything should end. But I want to show you my type of ending. My type of ending is to take the offender and so change the offender so that the offender and the one who has been offended can truly be reconciled. Right? Hmm. That sounds like the gospel. Doesn't it? That sounds like what God did to you and me, right? God had been offended. He sent his son to pay for the offenses that we all had committed. Then he sent his spirit and said, bring them to me. <laughs> and he forgave us all of our trespasses. All of our sins. That's a happy ending, isn't it? That's the ending you want, right? Is that the ending you want with Jesus? And we live happily ever after in heaven, in the new Jerusalem. Uh, is that the ending you want with Jesus? If that's the ending you want with Jesus, then that ought to be the ending you want with your brothers and sisters. If that's the ending you want with Jesus, then that's the ending you want with your brothers and sisters. If that's not the ending you want with your brothers and sisters, then you're lying. That's not the ending you want with Jesus. You can't have the head without the body. So doesn't true reconciliation express unity? The unity found in God's word. The unity expressed in our love for one another. Wow. Nobody trusts people who still do the same old stuff. <laughs> right? You remember Dr. Bobby Atkins years ago when we started this church? I, I, I hope to get him somewhere in our 20th year anniversary, somewhere during that month. If I, I think he's in Atlanta if I can find him. But, but, but Dr. Atkins preached a tremendous sermon. I, I still remember the title of his sermon. He preached Jesus is in the house. And then he, then, then he laid out what it means for Jesus to be in the house. But, but anyway, one of the things he said, is says, you keep doing things the same old way, all the same old time, expect the same old results. Because that's the best the flesh can do. But when you walk in the word, <laughs> expect results that you never imagined. <laughs> because God, you, you, you think you say God's best, keep living. Tony Evans tells this story about himself. This is what he says. He says, I have a steel plate in my leg, in my right leg. He says, it's a large steel plate that goes from my ankle all the way up to my knee. And he says, the plate is in my leg because I was playing football one day and intercepted a pass. I got hit with a cross body block. My cleat did not come out of the mud, so my leg snapped in half and I broke my tibia and fibula. He said, I was then taken off the football field and rushed to the hospital to find that my bone had been shattered. I had been hit and hurt badly, hurt to the point where it had broken me in two. But a doctor came along who knew how to correct the problem and went with me into the operating room. He opened up my leg and placed inside of it a steel plate with screws and then he reconnected bones that had been shattered. Without the doctor intervening that day, my leg would, would even now be crooked and I'd probably be walking with a limp because of the nature of the break. But somebody who understood the problem came in with a plate, and ever since then, that plate has been holding my brokenness together. Then he concludes, he says, God has given all of us the scalpel of his word in order to identify the sin that results in broken relationships. The work of the Holy Spirit is like a steel plate that brings and holds together that which has been shattered. So if there's going to be true reconciliation, we need the word, but we need the spirit applying the word. And God in his grace can bring together all that has been shattered and broken, and God can hold it together by his spirit, by his grace, 
for his glory. And then the church can really begin to reflect that in our oneness, the very oneness of the Godhead. May there be true reconciliation in our lives in this church. And I hope I'm talking to somebody. If you don't know Jesus Christ, don't you want him? You are unreconciled to God. You are condemned already because you have not believed on the name of the Son of the only begotten of, of God. You, you, you will perish. You will suffer eternally because you can't pay the debt that you owe. So you're always paying in hell. But what's God's answer to a relationship? Jesus Christ. Or better yet, as we learned this morning, who is God's answer? Who is God's righteousness? Jesus Christ. That's the only righteousness that God will accept. And if you come to Christ in faith and repentance, your whole life is wrong. Not just stuff you do, you are wrong. Your whole life is wrong. Your nature is who you are. You have a sinful nature and you are wrong. Therefore, your whole life is wrong. But you know what Jesus is about in reconciling you? giving you new life, drawing you to himself, providing all of your needs according to his riches in glory, kissing you and loving you forever. Anybody want that?